Welcome to Business and Life Advice with Tiny Advisors, where we give people mentoring, coaching, and free consulting on business, leadership, and career development. I'm a four-time entrepreneur, attorney, adjunct professor, and angel investor. In the last four years, I've read over 750 books on business, leadership, and self-development. I currently own and operate two companies, both in the services industries. If you're interested in free coaching, mentoring, or consultation on entrepreneurship, leadership, or self-development, click on the link below to register. In this episode, we have Anita Pierce, a superstar CEO. I'm excited to have her on to come ask some great questions. Anita, do you mind introducing yourself a bit? Uh, you, you've done the rest. Interview is over. We're done. <laughs> My name is Anita Pierce, and I'm the founder and CEO of 11375. We inspire individuals to be courageous in manifesting their dreams and creating wealth through entrepreneurship. We accomplish that through partnering with the city and state agencies to uh, support businesses to become certified, to contract, and also gain access to the the set aside specific for minority and women business enterprises. Um, we also provide training and facilitation to help to connect and provide our ecosystem with social impact. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm excited to have you on here. So I'd love to start off with you. Shared a little bit about uh, what you do. What's your goal for your business before we jump into your questions? So. That's a, that's a really great question. So my goal um, is multifaceted. And I'll say multifaceted because when I think about, you know, why I'm doing this, it's primarily to create freedom and independence, you know, ultimately. The other thing is a goal is to really to connect business owners specifically to resources. When I think about my genesis of starting in business, um, it was really about navigating spaces. My goal is to try to have, you know, individuals when they come to me, not to pay for the resources that I know they can get directly from the city and city and state agencies that they are looking to do business with. So full circle, um, just really thinking about um, connecting resources and making us all better, um, doing my part to help us become better as entrepreneurs. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So since you're helping everyone else, I'm excited to help you. What would be, what's your first question? Okay. Besides my blood type and your blood type. <laughs> now, so as I am thinking about my next level, um, my first question deals with best practices related to um, collaborating with other business owners. What do you recommend? Oh, goodness. Um, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, I just finished reading something about someone um, that I almost did business with who got into a lot of trouble. And I had no idea this stuff was going on in the background. Mm -hmm. Right? No idea. So one of the things I'll say best background research, right? Criminal reports. Um, things of that nature. Uh, it's certain things you can't do on the employee level, right? But uh, you can't do that on the partnership or if you're looking into other businesses level. Always talk to your lawyer. I'm not sure, this is not legal advice. Always talk to your lawyer. But just, it, it can start with, uh, depending on how much you're trying to do together, you can start with something simple as a Google search, LinkedIn search, verifications uh, to dive in deeper into a background check. Right. And there's also are uh, there there are also services that can help you perform that now. So you can subcontract that out if you feel that may be too much or outside of your scope of expertise. Background searches are not my expertise. I have my assistant help a bit with that, but that's not her expertise either. So depending on how much you want to do, diving into a real search of who is this person, has there been any complaints about them? Have they um, any charges filed and uh, have they been sent to jail? Etc. cetera, uh, have they gone bankrupt? Um, because there can't be great people who went bankrupt, but you may also want to kind of know what, how is somebody able to keep their financial commitments if you're going into, so I'll say that's one of the first major things to do um, on, on that and when you're looking to collaborate. Then uh, having a great attorney, right? Having a great attorney to write that out. 
regardless of regardless of um, how much you trust somebody, uh, you can let's say somebody's best of intentions. You can say something that somebody misinterpreted. They can say something that you misinterpreted. So having attorneys draft that out so they can at least have it written out what you both are agreeing to. And so if somebody forgets or somebody misremembers, you can go back to the document. Nope, this is what we discussed, right? And that's another way to hold yourself as accountable. But that goes back to number one, I would say is as strong as in a contract is, you still never really want to be in contract with somebody you can't trust. Mm. That's a headache too. So uh, I still, I always say, hey, if somebody, uh, if you're going to do business, have a contract, but if you are, um, if you don't trust somebody, a contract may not necessarily save you. It helps, but it some, takes a lot of money sometimes to really, to really go after somebody or make things right. And sometimes it's never even right if you do it that way. Okay, that prompted uh, another question about, so you mentioned um, in your response, and I thank you for that, about trust. How does that connect with trusting employees or members that you work with um you know so trust is you know from what you mentioned responding to business collaborations it seems like it's also connected to trusting your employees and staff members and contractors what advice would you give me to be able to navigate the space of trusting and letting go some task for members who work as a part of your team? Okay. Uh, that's a phenomenal question. <laughs> what I'll say is uh, similar things can arise. What you legally can do in background checks and reference checks to help you know, hey, is this type of person I can invest into, right? Um, is this somebody who has my best interest, somebody that's loyal, etc. So there's some things you can do before you hire somebody, but you can also check in after you've hired somebody. Hey, I'm looking to promote somebody. Did you, did you see this person transition well when they promoted or did they, or was the job too much for them, right? What made them leave your company? If you see somebody hopping around too much, you may not necessarily want to pour too much into them, right? So these are things to think about. We do something at our company. Uh, we're not, we've been doing this for six to eight months and we're going to continue to we do we do micro test right so when we're onboarding somebody we have micro tests which is every week uh, or every week you have a project a mini project you're supposed to complete to make sure we made the right hire right because anybody can say hey i can do xyz and they come in and they can't really do the job so sometimes you're not trying to give them the whole project you're, you're giving them developmentally what what should this person be able to do now so that we know it's the right hire or are we training wrong? And so we're giving micro check. And the beauty in that you can continue, even if somebody's been on your team for a long time, when you're sending them up to a level, maybe you want to give them micro test to say, okay, can they perform? Or opportunities as well, right? And opportunity is a time for somebody to step up, but it's also a time for somebody to possibly make a mistake, right? So it, it's 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 room for growth, but with almost all opportunities, it's also room for failure, both on the person side and on your side in terms of loss. So if you're talking risk mitigation, unfortunately, the risk is usually there, uh, but this ties into resources. Sometimes attorneys can help you out. It became a lot harder with uh, the recent ruling about um, non-competes that did become a lot harder, but there are things you can do um, in that way. The last thing I'll say, uh, we can dive in on it, but one more thing that I would add to that is asking people around them, right? Is this trust? Is this person trustworthy, or do you think this person can handle that? So this can be other colleagues on your team. This can be your spouse. This can be your family members. This can be your advisors, mentors. Bring people to spaces and seeing how they interact with other people, and um, and then asking people, hey, what's your opinion on this person? I'll say be very open about that in a way when you do that because you don't want people to start thinking you're just talking behind their backs about them because that can create another problem. Say, hey, this is what I do with everyone. I ask what people think um, about them, and I even ask people what they think about me. So people know it's not you trying to dig up dirt. It's really part of your discovery, uh, part of your discovery. Okay. So what I understood is that um, part of it as a takeaway for me, homework actually, is creating a system where you are 
uh, providing opportunities for micro testing the staff members for their success and to really understand where their weaknesses are and to help them to improve if they are. That's how you'll be able to figure out and discover if they're the candidate or the actual member that will continue to help you to grow your business. That's the first thing. The other thing I also heard was you really inquiring around for your team, for those who, if they work together, um, to just get input and feedback about the either the staff member or their quality of work and services, because that helps, again, for you as a leader to be able to learn where their gaps are. So those were, those were, those were great um, things that I took as a, a takeaway. Thank you. I, exactly. Exactly. More questions. Okay. So this is more on, um, you know, leadership development um, as a CEO and, and founder, um, making time for, um, you know, really molding yourself as a leader, right? What are some recommendations for those who are in, in this space may have had some experience to improve on their quality of leadership on leading because leading and managing i know to be different um and what the what can you provide uh, for those who've been in this space and are looking to tweak some of you know what's happening within their business but connecting that to their overall life uh, that's phenomenal uh, that's a phenomenal question uh, one of the things that a quote from john maxwell is a uh, company is capped by its leader's potential a company's cap by its leader's potential or a leader's skills. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of reading, right? <laughs> a very big proponent. Of reading. There's a ton of leadership books uh, diving into d diving into that process. I would also say leadership in part is who who around you is a, a great leader that you look up to because you're going to start seeing things they do. Um, I don't know, are you a basketball fan? Yes, I am. Okay. okay. So when uh, the the Redeem team in 2008, they went to take, I think in 2004, we didn't, um, the US, we didn't win the Olympics. So they put, um, there was LeBron came back, uh, but he was older now, Carmelo, um, Dwayne Wade, I believe at that time, but they, the big recruit was Kobe, Kobe Bryant, right? The big recruit was Kobe Bryant. And so Kobe Bryant, when they went in and LeBron, Dwayne, LeBron, uh, Carmelo Anthony, and so many players said they learned so much from being around Kobe Bryant because his work ethic was something that they couldn't, they didn't realize uh, was possible or should be done in the way how, how early he showed up to the gym, how hard he went. And that raised all, their, all of their games. And you can see the difference in terms of the rise and trajectory of LeBron before don't get me, he was still a phenomenon before uh, Kobe in the Olympics and after Kobe in the Olympics in terms of the skill level and rising. So what I would say is trying to be, even if you're great in your own right, trying to be around people who are amazing leaders, you'll start seeing the things they do, how they approach things, how they prepare, right? How they react. And that will, and that's something that you can skim or borrow <laughs> to utilize in your own business and life. So essentially you're saying to be around leaders or that you can model and yeah. also including um, reading quality, you know, just taking care of your mind in terms of reading and educating yourself on books and uh, podcasts or things of that nature. Yeah, and I want to push a little bit past you can model because LeBron could have modeled off Carmelo. He could model Dwayne Wade. Uh, people who are at the top Right, as close to the top as you can get, right? Um, people who are at the top, so you can really watch how do I perform? How do I need to uh, prepare to get to that level? How do I need to think to get to that level? Because you're already around great leaders, right? But can you get around people who are one or two levels up or three or five levels up? And that's going to really change what you're doing and how you do it. So it sounds like there's a there's a there's a lot of um, discipline and consistency that will be required of me to learn that new skill, especially if I want to 
uh, model what that who who that that top person is. Mm-hmm. That that is what's going to be required. But even more so, when you do that, they'll show you how they create that discipline. Because Kobe, Kobe didn't go out to party with the rest mm-hmm. of the guys, right? And he, he didn't. And that when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And the more Kobe said, no, discipline a lot is about saying no, right? Saying no to this so you can have the time to do that time and energy to do that. And they'll start showing you, you get pushed in, you kind of get forced to do what they're doing because that's the only way you can be around them. You're not mm-hmm. going to play around. They're not going to have certain people. So now it, it seems it's so difficult at first, but then it starts becoming a routine, a habit, right? And a part of your way of life. And now you're really accelerating and your whole circle changes, right? And the impact you have is greater because now you, the people who you were influencing before, they're looking at you and they're looking and they're like, oh, wow, I saw how she came from X to Z and I want to emulate that. Okay. So let's stay, let's stay around this pop topic about, um, you know, leadership development. How do you manage time as you are running business? In my case, I'm a mom, um, wife. Um, you know, mentor, you know, what are some of the ways that you can recommend to, cause there's a lot of things that I realize that I don't do just, you know, by nature of my lifestyle that I'm creating. Um, but how do you really navigate those specific spaces and still, you know, manage time and, you know, try to build the multi-trillion dollar business an empire that we are creating any advice so that's a great question i think one that many people have is that how do you manage time i'm forgetting which book this came from but somebody said something that really stuck with me he said you don't manage time you manage activities right mm-hmm. don't manage time you manage activities so one of the things uh there's several ways to go about this uh one thing to know is I, I still cope with this and try to figure, but multitasking doesn't work as well as we think it does, right? We're, we're just quickly switching in between tasks. And the issue with that is you don't get to build momentum. So that's the first level, understanding that principle and knowing, okay, can I fix, focus uh, on something for time? And then time blocking. Are you time blocking in terms of, okay, can I focus on this issue or this thing I have to do and give myself time to build momentum. So does that take an hour? Does that take a day? Does that take a week? And being able to focus in on things that are really going to move you, your business, your life forward, right? So that that leads into number two, which is prioritization, right? So I, I something me and my team, we always talk about is what is the, uh, what's our Pareto principle? What is the 20% of things we need to do that will achieve 80% of the results, hmm. right? And knocking that, knowing that new, uh, that statistic, right? And that principle and how can we focus on that? What is our 20% we need to focus on? And you'll start seeing, okay, do I really need the other 20%? Uh, but if you, even if you break that principle down, it gets a little bit more crazy because out of that 20%, you can do 20 of that 20, which is 4% gets you 64% of the results, right? So what do we really need to focus on? What do we really need to focus on and how can I prioritize that and do that first and um, you utilize that to move myself, my business, my life forward, right? Uh, and we can dive into any of these, but I would give you another thing that really opened my eyes. I don't know if this was from Mel Robbins or someone else. I really need to have like a book where I write down quotes. It's in my head, but I don't always remember the authors. But the person said, uh, the person, t- there's something called golden hour or golden hours. And during this time, you are two to sometimes five X as productive, right? For some people, that's early morning. Some people, that's late night. Some people, that's two o'clock. But there's a specific time frame where you are uh, either multiple or exponentially more productive. For me, that's early morning. So literally I can be four to five X time, four to five X more productive between let's say five to 9.30 AM than I am the rest of the day. So if I'm four to five X, let's just say four, 
uh, five, five to that's about four hours times four, that's 16 hours of productive work that I can get done because I see how quickly I move, how sharp I am, the type of decisions I make. So I can just work that time and not work any other time in the day and really knock things out. So, uh, some people have shorter windows. Some people have longer windows. Sometimes it's not, I don't get all that for. Sometimes I have one hour out of that. But understanding that and utilize and not giving that golden hour to things that are not high impact. So during that time, that breakout time, you are saving that time and you are guarding it off from everything, possibly for the things that are most impactful to you and your business. You know, it's it's very interesting that you um, talk about having this, the goal, which you refer to as the golden hour and what that looks like. So I remember um, when I was, you know, just really starting my business, you know, there were times where I, I have a, a daughter, you know, she's very uh, bold and, and very involved in the business as well. And so I would work when she would sleep. Um, and then still try to maintain that level of energy, you know, throughout the day, which would be, you know, meeting times and, but it will be overnight. Um, but then I found myself burning out because I wasn't sleeping properly. And so, you know, these days I choose sleep over, you know, burning right now, just because I need to preserve you know, that energy for those top things um, that I know I need, you know, that that I that I really can't delegate. Th those are things that I that I can't delegate. Not that I won't, is that right now I cannot delegate. So I am prioritizing for me, um, you know, working even out of, you know, because right now I'm in my home office, but even out of my home office, when I need, you know, focus, I leave, I go to a workspace. I don't even work out of my home anymore, just because I know that sleep is important right now for me. And so just knowing that I have, you know, important tasks that I know that is going to, you know, 10 X my business, I need to step outside the house, but also sleep is really important, but I am planning on getting back into those, um, night hours because I have a, I have a goal to write a book over the summer. And so, you know, I wanted to just get some thoughts from other, uh, entrepreneurs that I respect because it can be a challenge when you're, you're, you're trying to navigate and grow and you see the vision in your business, um, you know, what that time management and prioritization looks like for me. So I thank you for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. And congratulations. Writing a book is a big, big task. So I've been told. Um, <laughs> big task. Please RSVP me and let me get one of the first 10 books. I would love that. Um, I would say this, really try to, I don't know if it's nighttime, focus in what is your golden hour. Mm. And while I, I can't say I don't have a, <laughs> I don't have a little one yet, so I can't say, hey, you, but just even if you only are able to utilize one hour for that, the, the, uh, the momentum you're going to get and the amount of work you will do during that time will open up two to five extra hours later on in the day. Even if you want to use those two at five to nap, right? <laughs> it, it, you can balance it out that way. And I would, I, if one thing you take away from this conversation, you can figure that golden out for you and just guard that, whether it's your book or something else for your business, you'll just see how you will launch forward. Okay. Awesome. So I do have, um, two more questions and one, um, is following up on your experience as an angel investor. I know that we shared, um, you know, time and space together, and you mentioned about that being your experience. So I've been looking at um, a few businesses that I am, I, I want to do. This is me wanting to do and to help them to start their process, I guess, get a leg up. But I still, I'm still unsure about the real formal process or how formal it should be. Because I know that you mentioned that, um, you know, in past conversations, whether it was in our class or just, you know, in general, that we have to be prepared for the loss. What does that look like in terms of percentage? Is it based upon industry average? 
or just knowing that within the first, you know, five years that businesses may have a possibility of not being successful and that you just may lose your money? Great question. Um, great question. So it is, it's not just losing your money, losing all of your money on that business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? So to a point where whatever you put in, it's not coming out. Uh, I say that, let, let's just think about this, right? They, they have statistics of how many businesses make it past one year, how many businesses make it past two years, how many businesses make that those numbers don't change in angel investing, right? Or those numbers don't change for startups. So that that's what you're facing, right? That's what you're facing. And the companies, the 10% of companies that may make it out, that doesn't mean they're wildly profitable either. That's true. Right. So when you're looking into this and when you're negotiating your deal and when you're figuring out how you want to utilize your money uh, for angel investing, in my opinion, it shouldn't be money that you can't lose. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you know, my wife just, oh, goodness, the, the cup, she's like, hey, what's going on with this company and what's going on with that company? And like two companies, like say two of these companies, she's not going like carrying this late, but two of these companies did just one is, one is shutting down and the other one is going to probably shut down as well or might not make it through unless the negotiating uh, acquisition that can save them uh if that goes well yes if not they may have to shut down and so i'm looking at five figures of a loss right there on that so that's something just just to consider i think uh on top of that you have to know angel investing is not liquid Meaning, unlike the stock market, you can't just get your money back at any time. And where the, if you buy stock, you can sell it. Usually during uh, Monday, Monday through Friday, you can just sell it during normal business hours. In angel investing, you you may be locked up for five to ten years before you might five to twelve years before you may get a return. Okay. Right. So understand the lock up period on that. I know everybody glamorizes it, but that's what you're looking at. Uh, the Third thing I would say is angel. Uh, some people in our GS cohort ask me about this, and because of the risk, let's say if you look, at maybe nine of ten companies don't succeed. If you're doing well, <laughs> um, that you're just getting one that really is pronounced. Most people are not even getting that one out of ten, right? It has to be so profitable it makes up for the other nine plus a, a multiplier. Plus okay. the time you're waiting for. So it can't be your regular mom and pop, right? It has to be something, in my opinion, that's super scalable to make up where, okay, maybe I make a hundred X of this and off of one and that makes it worth it. Better better off a thousand, better off 10,000, right? And that really makes it worth it because it's unlikely most people are going to hit one out of 10. Usually people might hit one out of 30 and then you're playing in a numbers game. Do you have enough liquid to risk 29 companies going down? before finding the one, right? With everything else that's going on, your own business that needs its own capital. So these are things to think about. Uh, so if you do it, I can't say it can only be, especially if you run your own business, it, it's not only about the money because the process to really do well, you have to do a lot of due diligence, right? So it, it can't only be out of the money. It also has to be, you kind of want to help these people. You really have to want, and that is, and willing to risk your own business to do it. So that's something to think about. Wow. Okay. So, um, may I follow up with a question? Cool. This um, is good time. You have time, so. So, for those businesses that you invest in, and you know, at some point the um, business owner comes back to you you know, year two after you invest and say, hey, you know, things are not looking um, so well and I'm looking to sell my business. Um, would you or could I, if, you know, I see opportunity to turn the business around, buy it? Mm -hmm. That is that um, something that is, um, can be, I guess, renegotiated in, in the agreement terms um, or, you know, is that something that is best practice? You know, what is your um your experience with that so yes that's something that can be negotiated in the agreement term so let's take it one of the companies that i have invested in they are trying to th there's a opportunity for them right there's opportunity for them to sell the business some other investors the issue is when you do you the business owner can't necessarily sell the company by 
itself, right? They have to typically get approval from the board and sometimes from the shareholders as well. So now even if they want to sell it to you, now the shareholders may demand, hey, I want X return on this, right? So I want you to sell it for at least two times my investment or at least five times my investment if I sell it. And you have to look at it like, is it worth that to me? And sometimes shareholders may be hard headed, not realizing, hey, <laughs> this business, if I don't sell it, it's going to go to zero. Mm-hmm. And some may, for whatever reason, may rather that uh, it goes to zero than it's sold to somebody else. Um, so it's not just negotiating with the CEO, it's also knowing who is backing them and what are their interests. Can I buy it off them? And then do you want to do that work? I typically invest in companies four out of the five sectors I invest in, I have no operational experience with it, right? So I'm not going to take over those companies. <laughs> um, or like, maybe I could, but it's I wasn't investing to take over those companies. So, But people have different uh, MOs, right, when they're investing. So that might be something you want to do. Okay. And also you can start small or relatively small. You can start... Uh, with depending on where you're investing with a few hundred dollars uh, if you do an angel list uh, angel list is like a platform for investing in some startups that have via syndications you can do something as low as 1000 right to kind of get your feet where i would say don't jump in too hard at the beginning right because there's tons to learn okay mm-hmm. and then um my final final thought is more about um operations and what that looks like in terms of you know ease of doing it because right now i am um you know reached in a process of just really changing what my operations are looking like um in terms of you know what type of software systems you know crms that i'm using um anywhere anything down from the type of um healthcare services that I'm going to be offering going forward. Um, why is that so difficult? <laughs> uh, and, and that's like a, that's, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not a negative thing. So I don't want anyone who's watching this to think that I'm like, you know, woe is me because I've been in this space for nine years and being an entrepreneur full time is just generally about risk taking about betting on yourself, but it's also about creating your dreams. But when it comes to, you know, figuring out, you know, what appropriate uh, uh, task operations that are going to be connected to those tasks, it, it could be very challenge. specifically for me, very challenging. I need help. Why is it so hard? <laughs> for you and me both. <laughs> it's hard for you and me both. Uh, I think I so one of my, uh, I audited uh, MBA business school while I was in law school. And one of the professors, uh, Michael Burcham, uh, he was the head of the National Entrepreneurship Center too. He's, he had some, he had a quote for, he had something which he said, uh, an operations person can always find a job because every single company needs great operations and can be improved. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not just a you problem. And I would often, something else that I recently saw, they said most CEOs or founders, most founders, excuse me, are come from sales, they're a salesperson, or they're a product person, right? It's not, it's not an operations person usually who's starting a company. Um, so knowing that and knowing, hey, this might not be my mice and that's okay. I'll say there's a, there's a progression or a line you can think of uh, in terms of how to go about this. Uh, yes, you can go look at getting an ops manager a C- or a, top, a COO, right? Uh, chief operating officer. You can look at that, hey, I want to partner with a chief operating officer, someone who can come in and run my business and help me um, create the process flows, et cetera. That's one thing. Or you can also go to the other end. I want to find an assistant a virtual assistant who is phenomenal at one part of this. That can be um, who's great at CRM or who is great at, um, what are the other, uh, great at some of these things like monday.com or Asana or et cetera. And who really knows this? This is my, this is part of my 20% that 
impacts the business. I want to find someone who can really do that and I'll build that out. That's actually how I started. I had somebody who came in, uh, was my, my first, she was a jack of all trades, right? Uh, but she actually had really good, she had ways of implementing and creating SOPs and procedures. And that started helping us scale out when we were building that. And then build out, okay, hired another person who also was really good at, who was pretty good at operating. And then both of those was balancing. And finally, uh, later on, grew into hiring an operations manager, right? So these things, it doesn't have to be, oh, I just have to jump to the top. You can also start with, let me find somebody virtual or in person who can help out with a piece of the puzzle or this part of the puzzle and figure out as I build out and scale out. Yeah. That's really good. That's really good. Yeah, but you got this. You, you definitely have this. Um, Listen, you've been saying that you've been saying that to me like forever <laughs> since we since we were in the core. You was like, yeah, you got this. I'm like, well, if Archambeau believe it, I better believe it. <laughs> you, do. you do, and I think the beautiful thing is, even the core for me, it, it, I didn't realize, even with my professor saying this, how important operations was to my business. Right. And why I always seemed to be kept. I couldn't get above a certain number because there was not enough process and systems in place where, okay, I this isn't scalable past X. Right. right? And I kept on what and that's some that's the formula sometimes having that ops person who can unlock that valve so you can go focus more on sales or you can build out a sales team. Right. So these things is it's sometimes knowing and being frustrated about that, that may be part of your twenty percent. How can I go and implement operations to get to that next level, right? And I think, um, especially with most businesses, we don't have great operations. And that's the, one of the major differences between small businesses and large enterprises. They have SOPs, they have guidebooks, they have onboarding processes, they have hiring processes, they have payroll mapped out, and they can stick one person in to handle it and they have a whole training process to get somebody somewhere. So this is something to know, okay, maybe this is my gap. Yeah, that's a that's a helpful reminder. I'm in the midst of um, doing a lot of relationship building during this time for government contracts. It is on fire right now. Um, and it's just been um, managing, you know, relationships, training, what I know, because, you know, there is like myself, but then, you know, my other two team members, I'm training them because I need to really get the, the that strategy down out of me into someone else. Um, because once I have someone to focus in on that, I feel like, you know, I can do, you know, the other things like being on a beach and uh, hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> And you can, and you'll see that, right? And you'll see that. So what are your next steps? For business or just, you know, in life right now? For your growth plan. Oh, so right now I am, um, next step is to build out this accelerator, um, write a book and also navigate, you know, what other dreams that I have that's on my vision board. Oftentimes I get, I, I mean, if, if, if I'm being responsible, I can look at my vision board and I'm like, oh, that's not, not, that's not a not right now. Um, but also just removing the fear of, and trying some of the things, testing, just like I tested, you know, my business brunch. That's in its third going into its fourth year. That came off my board. Um, but just finding little things that um, will help me to have the courage to move forward. Because what I do recognize is in this space is that um, entrepreneurship, I say it all the time, is not for the faint of heart. You have to have extreme faith and courage, but in also putting um, work behind and activities behind these dreams that you have. So build, building out the business accelerator, writing a book, finally actually for myself and for my mini my mini ceo um because she has a book that she wrote on my vision board um that wants to be in production as well and then also continuing to do what i do um which is to connect resources 
uh, specifically with businesses of color, because I know that within this space of government contracting, it could be very daunting, but I also know that it can, it's very possible with the system and a strategy that you have to keep executing for your overall success. I love that. I love that. Um, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. I would also say, do you want to share the title of your book or promote any of your services so that the world, hopefully the world can hear of it and you never know right now? Well, yeah, for the book, I haven't really decided on a title, not for the one that I'm going to write, but the one for the kid. It's called Savannah Goes to the Bank. And it's actually um, a children's book that, um, you know, she, uh, and I'll just tell a little bit about it if I can in like two minutes, less than two. Um, you know, we um, would drink water bottles and um would recycle them would take the money you know we pay for it but then she didn't understand well why do why do we pay for the additional you know recite to recycle we would take it to the the place to recycle and we would take that money and put it in a bank and so earlier on um we would go to the bank and it would be like oh my god they have lollipops depending on which bank we would go to they have pens um, but I started getting her accustomed to going into these places because I wanted her not to be uncomfortable about what these these financial institutions can do, but also to be able to sit down and have conversations while I'm doing business. She's right there, even though it didn't make sense. As she's gotten older, um, you know, she's nine now, she knows, okay, well, it's time to put my money in my bank or, you know, how much I am, how much have I invested or where's my credit card? She, yeah, I've, you know, done some things. So it's around really having her understand the purpose and other children to read about the purpose, about what the financial institutions, their purpose is, and having a level of being comfortable and utilizing those resources that exist to start your process that you can leverage when you want to eventually open your business. So that's one. The other book is really about, you know, my journey so far in this space of being an entrepreneur, um, being a mom, being a wife. And what does that really look like? It, I don't have a title as of yet. I haven't had the inspiration as of yet, but I'm really proud of what I was able to accomplish thus far. Like I've, if I do nothing else um, in this time that I'm here, I feel like I've accomplished so much. I know that, you know, there's more to come, but I want to be able to share what that journey is. Like my experience as being a government contractor, you know, going through the certification process, how scary it was, how, you know, how you have to find the right people that you can, to your point earlier about you, you can trust to collaborate with. But I also know that I've had significant and measurable success. So it makes me extremely proud that I was able to accomplish that with now supporting other businesses to do the same. So that's number one, number one and number two. Thank you. Um, that's beautiful. And I can't wait to read both of those. Uh, I even, I, I love how you acclimated your daughter to banking because that's something that scares most people walk in the bank, ask for a loan or look for financing or just interact with bank tellers. So she's getting very comfortable in spaces most people find uh, terrifying. Right? Well, I, I think about, I think about my, my process. So even though I worked in areas of financial services, when I went into business, you know, on that side, it was different. You know, I've always had an account and whether I was responsible or not at the time, you know, being appropriately acclimated to, yes, you can go in and talk to your business banker about your goals, your dreams, and what's happening, but you also have to have, you know, the supported documentations through a PL statement, uh, a business plan uh, to be able to access and leverage the resources that are there. That only came after, um, you know, I started business and able to talk about it and experience it prior to then no so i want her to be very comfortable to the point where when we go into the bank they know her name they know she's coming so we set aside twice a month where we either do that process of recycling then it's like oh we have a couple of dollars we're going to the bank 
but I also pay her out of my business. So I give her a check to go to the bank so that she can make her own deposit. That's her process. And sometimes she tells me she needs to be paid. <laughs> <laughs> you teach me. She's, she's known how to ask and negotiate. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got paid. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Okay. So yes. What other, what question? What other questions do you have of me? There may be something that you may be curious about. Since I ask you a lot of questions, if there are any. Yeah. So one of the things uh, you said you're looking for partners, and you're looking uh, that, well, well, that was one of your questions around. What are you looking for in a partner? What would make a this, partnership for meaning going after contracts or going after other things? What would make a partnership worth it to you? Absolutely. Uh, being business compliant, um, what I find that there are uh, significant gaps. So I'll say, for example, maybe not having adequate uh, insurance, right? Because when you're on the contracts, you have to have not just the general liability, there's also workers' comp, disability. Mm -hmm. And depending on the actual um, request for proposal, they may ask for commercial insurance. So you have to have all those things. Um, being able to maintain good records, right? And so even though you may be a, a subcontractor, you know, if you decide that as a part of your contract, you, you know, may want to, you know, bring someone else on to have, um, you know, what I call street creds or government creds, etc. Um, you want to make sure that you have good books. So having use of, you know, QuickBooks or even, I, I want to say even an Excel sheet, but it's more uh, easier to discover if you use some sort of a accounting tool to help you to be able to document your, 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 your items. Um, you don't have to have all the experience, but definitely a good reputation. Um, I've worked really hard to just establish myself as a reputable business thought leader in this space and i'm still learning um so i am looking for those who have you know a great reputation I'm not and i'm not talking about things that may have happened in your past because we all have a past well every one of us but just more so that we are consistently um being a part of a positive world that we want to see in this space Social impact. So I am a philanthropist, philanthropist, however you want to call it. Um, I invest in a lot of businesses, not through the angel investing, but more so through a grant process that I navigate through um, a, a business event through the Full Circle Business Bunch. And it makes me really proud that I have the access and the ability to do that without somebody knowing it or making it well, it's known here, but, you know, unless you talk to me, you wouldn't know that I do that. Mm -hmm. Or unless you come to my events, you wouldn't know that that's a thing. And I, and it makes me really blessed, feel blessed that I can do that. And so aligning with partners that, you know, are willing to connect unselfishly. And I, and I use that word unselfishly because when we're in this space, I, I firmly believe that um, on earth, we are responsible for the space that we are to create. That's me personally. And I also think that giving back and having the organizations that I work with to say that this is the pipeline that we need to create. So a part of what we're doing with this contract, we're going to go to Brownsville, East New York, best or parts of the Bronx to say we're going to find a, a group of, of or nonprofit that we're going to have them have access to summer youth programs. Maybe they don't want to work for the regular SYEP. Maybe they want to work for a small business and that we're able to fund them for the summer and then figure out how to how do it every summer. Maybe it's back to school, may not be a big deal. Maybe it's connecting you know, uh, banks or other com uh, community development financial institutions into our communities to help to fund small businesses. So when I think about the type of partners that I want, um, business compliance, um, you know, good reputation, and I'm not saying, and I'm not suggesting perfect. There's a, there's a big distinction because everyone has a past, but just that you are doing good business, that you have a good reputation and the social impact. I'm not waving on that, you know, at all. 
Um, I find that when I am in that space where I am connecting resources that I know someone deep, deep in Brownsville, Brooklyn, may not have access, that means that I've done my job. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. So uh, do you have any more questions as we wrap up? No, I am. Um, this was really helpful. Um, you know, and again, I'm in business, you're in business, but I believe that um, we can definitely learn from one another. And I learned so much from you. Um, and I want to thank you for doing this because I think it's useful for me. I took notes, both written and mental notes. Um, and then I'm looking forward to seeing what more you'll be doing with your businesses and also to tap in again, because I know I'm going to need you. So there you have it. <laughs> Definitely going to need you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you. So that wraps up today's episode of Business and Life Advice with Atani Advisors featuring Anita Pierce. We hope you found our coaching and mentoring on entrepreneurship, leadership, and finance insightful and inspiring. Please, if you enjoyed this episode and want to stay connected with us, hit the subscribe button. And also, if you're interested in coming on this podcast, look below to see a link where you can register. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you.